I will give my presentation in French. And I will talk about the notion of jurisdiction and human rights. I would like to share with you a highly pragmatic approach of the ECHR. Information that I will share with you is a technical information, but you will be handed out the text of my presentation. Well, the system of protection of ECHR has wanted to give a body of the convention of the, the, the idea of the protection of human rights that could have guaranteed protection and that could have been effective. We must remember <coughs> of Tegel that was considered the founding father of the convention, according to which the main risk that man faces is the reason of a state. So we should change the group, called, uh, the group protection within the European framework, that could have been the guarantee, that could guarantee its efficacy. The reasons that were at the source of uh, significant progress made in Europe must be found in the idea that human rights or the rights of the uh, men are just the direct expression of the idea of men. According to the declaration of Santiago de Compostela of 1989, drafted by the International Institutes of International Rights, aimed at ensuring the rights of men within the state. So it, is, uh, it stems from the Charter of United Nations and the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Men. So this is the formula that has been used by the International Court of Justice according to the sentence on the 5th of February, obligation erga omnes. This obliges all the states and all the states have legal interest in, protect, in protecting human rights. So the Strasbourg court have always considered that according to the measures that fall under the convention, and this is due to a twofold right of action that may trigger a process, that is to say the right to bring a case from a private, as a private individual. So under the Rome status, uh, Rome statute, we are not talking about the a state. We are talking. Uh, no, we are not talking about the individual. We are talking about the state that has to be accountable before a higher court. But protecting the rights of uh, men means that impunity, impunity is eliminated. Impunity that could, from which all of those who violate or breach human rights could benefit. It is clear that in a normal situation, every abuser of uh, human rights must be accountable before the national courts of the state he belongs to, European in this case, and in this case has to be accountable uh, before the community of the state parties, and, has to, and then the victims have to offer reparation. So what can we say about the breaches that take place outside this framework? They have been gradually ignored. But how, how we should react if we face situation where we have to take a, a sides one way or another? For instance, when it comes to prosecution, when we are um, uh, making use of immunity in a third country. This is the notion that should be given to the idea of jurisdiction according to the Article 1 of Rome Treaty. All states recognize freedoms of right to everyone that falls under the uh, Rome Treaty. That would be the um, literal interpretation. It, we could conclude that the um, empowerment of power of the state is limited to the national framework. A detailed and careful analysis of this Strasbourg um, 
court or what the Strasbourg court has decided requires careful attention because the states the states should be understood as territorial, as a territory, unless in some circumstances the situation goes beyond this framework. And perhaps this is where the interest of the interpretation of the Strasbourg Court presides regarding the conception or understanding of human rights wherever they have been breached. The principle declared by the Strasbourg Court could go beyond the European framework. It would be kind of relief because the values underlying that declaration apply or are applicable to all the human beings on Earth. We are not talking about territoriality here. These are the issues that I will be talking right now. Well, the first topic, jurisdiction, territorial jurisdiction. The court has stated several times that the convention, I quote, it is an institutional instrument of European public order. Therefore, it couldn't criticize the acts committed in the states that are non-party states. So the exercise of jurisdiction under Article Number One, it is a necessary condition for a state to be accountable for the acts that has committed or has not committed. And this is at the origin of the breach of the convention. If the jurisdiction of a state is territorial, the acts that have taken place outside the territory can, in some cases, in some exceptional cases, um, can be judged or can be executed or implemented according to a territorial jurisdiction. Here we have a special context. Well, the principle of territorial jurisdiction, according to 2008, and to a sentence given in 2008, defines jurisprudence. And then it has had many problems regarding a, the principle of non-admissibility. In some cases, for instance, the bombing from NATO airplanes of some buildings in Belgrade. This reasoning used by the court has made us think that in some cases, the competencies of the powers of the court had been extended because it recognized these acts that had been committed before or outside the state. In the case of 2008, Kenny against Nakude, the Strasbourg court said, and I quote, by exception, principle of territoriality, the jurisdiction of a state may go beyond the actions committed by this body that are deployed outside the territory, same as the use of force by the agents outside the state that operate outside their territory may be considered, um, when it may fall under the jurisdiction. This is the end of the quote. At the same time, the principle according to which the jurisdiction of the state, according to Article Number One, and limitation to its own territory, has another exception to it. Whenever military or legal action, whenever the state exerts effective control on an area which is located outside the territory, and I quote, whenever control of that territory is established, for instance, on Iraq, it is not necessary to determine whether the state party is implementing precise control on the policies carried out by the local governments or whether this control is subordinated because it ensures the existence of this administration or the, 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 the administration is maintained through these military actions. Article number one of the convention establishes that all the rights according to the convention, and it also establishes that there is a violation of those rights." End of quote. It is established that the court 
recognizes that according to Article Number One of the Convention, there is a universal com uh, jurisdiction. In some cases, in some cases, to investigate events that have been taking place all over the world, provided this latter can be um, attributed to a state party under the convention. However, another aspect should be mentioned here. There is an extension of the jurisdiction of the state party according to the convention that may cover some of the actions that were committed abroad and for which they are accountable. So, therefore, the territorial jurisdiction of that state it can be modified. So, therefore, non-state parties could use this territorial jurisdiction and to prosecute some actions conducted by their own agents. This is related to situations for instance, regarding the functionality of the states. The Strasbourg Court, for instance, regarding the standing case in 2001, there has been lots of controversy by the stakeholders. There has been uh, an action has been brought to trial due to acts of torture in Iraq torture committed by one authority agent in that country. So immunity has been invoked. The court have uh, seen uh, a violation or a breach of the human right, and this has been highly, this has opened, uh, has been raised a great debate. Prohibition of torture has been mandatory under international law, the court has made a distinction between the criminal uh, accountability of an individual due to torture as, and the application or implementation of the principle of immunity in cases of civil actions due to uh, acts of torture that have been committed within the territorial. We have to take into account that the court in these cases has shown the particular nature of international law. The court perceives or sees according to these decisions that there is no solid element that allows uh, that allow the international law not that countries cannot enjoy immunity before other countries whenever torture has been committed. To conclude, even we can see that the prohibition of torture is increasingly recognized. Judges do not judge so immunity is not considered whenever torture was committed committed outside the state. This uh, conviction has been applied by nine judges against eight. Well, we could see that there has been conflict sometimes between different judges, because here we have the notion of morality on human rights. So according to the disagreeing opinion of these judges, prohibition of torture is a rule of use consent that should prevail over immunity. In this case, convention of the court had not been examined yet, and the case of John's 14th of January 2014 considered the issue of the legitimacy of immunity and its legitimacy according to the treaty. Again, this is an action that was brought to UK tribunals for body damages and for tortures committed in Saudi Arabia. The court decided in the Alassane case to follow the reasoning. And then it looked at the situation from two perspectives. First of all, Saudi state and the court based its ruling on the sentence 
that have been issued by the CPI in the Germany and Italy case, the Ferini case, well known in Italy. There was uh, it was Germany Italy case. According to the second aspect, and according to the national officers, the court examines the state of the question according to the development that had unfolded in some European states or not, and according to the reasoning of the International Court of Justice. Two aspects have been tackled. In international law, there is a rule of immunity for national state officers, and there is an exception, an exception to the principle of humanity, humanity against or, or towards the actors of uh, torture or perpetrators of torture. We will have to examine this question. However, the court ruled on behalf where immunity can be invoked by the state, then the starting point must be that immunity ratione materia applies to the acts of state officials. If it were otherwise, state immunity could always be circumvented by suing named officials. There is also extensive case law at national and international level which concludes that acts performed by state officials in the course of their service are to be attributed for the purposes of state immunity to the state on whose behalf they act. The weight of authority at international and national level, therefore, appears to support the proposition that state immunity in principle offers individual employees or officers of a foreign state protection in respect of acts undertaken on behalf of, of the state under the same cloak as protects the state itself. Quant à la deuxième de ces questions, la cour, c'est-à-dire... The court has stated that there is an exception, an exception to the principle of immunity. Immunity. Well, the court developed a reasoning, a complex reasoning, that seems to follow a clear line of immunity, functional immunity of the officers. It is a principle that has been admitted under international law, even in cases of allegation of torture. The court says that if the individuals benefit from this immunity, but if that, well, if the torture or the, has not been committed whilst in office. But it is true to say that people working outside their company, or fee, oh, sorry, officials working outside their companies, they benefit from immunity. So there is uh, lots of concerns about what the, what the court says. International law, this is a matter which needs to be kept under review by contracting states. À l'évidence, par ces dernières remarques, cet arrêt traduit un certain malaise. So we could perhaps consider the fact that perhaps states could assume some of these acts. In fact, those that were committed outside the European space and accept the immunity due to severe acts of torture committed abroad by officers of a third party country that would be in accordance to the values of the courts and to the principle of prevalence of law. That's my question. I go back to the second part of my presentation power or jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court, where it recognizes universal jurisdiction, where there is jurisprudence that it is too prudent 
according to the war, to the laws that were created at a time where he, human rights were not that strongly defended as it is. Well, there is a law or a rule including some morality and effective, offering effective protection of human rights. When it comes to immunity, there seems to be a framework, a framework that is very daring and brave. And in many cases, it offers essential guarantees through very strict reasonings. However, the physical integrity of a person is very important and has to be preserved, whatever the nature of the actions that are recriminated to a person, to an individual. So we should not be surprised that seeing at this being an innovation, that is to say, the jurisdiction of a state party under the Convention of Human Rights. And I have it here, and uh, this is a convention of the case Afghan and Kulov. It's a Mama Kulov and Afgarov. According to the jurisprudence of the court, a tradition on from one of the state parties could raise a problem according to Article Number 3, that is to say the physical integrity of the person and as well as the accountability of the states. Can be questioned if there is an extradition to a third country and the person it runs the risk of being subjected to something which goes against Article Number 3 of the Convention. So. Well, according to Article Number Three, it is not about showing. It's not about the exposing the responsibility of the state according to the convention. But in so much as the accountability is at stake, we are talking about the state party. It is the state party who that is extraditing a perpetrator. Therefore, this perpetrator runs the risk of being subjected to torture. Well, there is a common base of ideals, prevalence of law according to the Convention of Human Rights. If one state sends another a person to another person, that person could be victim of torture in the state that it's being sent to. We have this Mari case in the Macedonia, the Republic of Macedonia. In this case, we have there is a problem of collision with international terrorism. A person has been arrested by the Macedonian authorities. The, this is a CIA agent that complains about being subject to prohibited treatment, that is to say, to torture. And the framework of this event was just the, the extraordinary delivery, extraordinary rendition of this person. On this point, the court has been very clear. It highlights the importance of this case of the victim, uh, not only for him and for other victims and the public who have the right to know about what happened. This extraordinary rendition has uh, been highly controversial, global controversial. Many international organizations, many NGOs from all over the world have uh, shown their agreement, have shown themselves in favor of uh, human rights. And they have declared that many states didn't really want to know or to reveal the truth. So the US government did this allegation before the Europe, US uh, courts. The court, and I quote again, believes that the authorities of the Macedonian state, when got information about the allegation, should have carried out proper investigation so that it didn't look like, in, like impunity for those acts. Well, this complex has been very complex, however, if there are difficulties of hindrances, 
preventing an investigation from making progress, for instance, on the issue of violation of human rights, authorities are essential when it comes to preserving the trust of the public on the principle of legality or legitimacy and tolerance or not tolerance or repeal of unlawful acts. The public wants to examine the conclusions and to ensure that the perpetrators are held account accountable according to what has been stated in Europe about the removal of impunity in cases of serious violation of human rights. States are obliged to preserve the state of law and as well as the trust of the public in the legal and judicial system. However, if the investigation is not carried out properly, has prevented the defendant from having enough information and from having comprehensive information about its case and the accountability of the defendant's state. And then this person was delivered or sent out to the US government. And it was said that, well, that the plane that left Macedonia with this person on board, the court has already judged some of the reports and has expressed, according to well, has question of the methods used to interrogate some of the persons, some of the persons involved in this. Uh, to conclude, given the different what happened in this case and the situation with the U.S. administration, the court considers that there has been an extraordinary retention from one state to the other. And this measure is to apply it in cases of torture and in case of degrading and inhuman treatments. I will be brief in my presentation. I will. So I would like to leave my presentation here. I would like to. So that you gain access to it. I would like to mention other cases. And we will only quote one more conviction regarding inadmissibility in a French case. Actions of a Navy official from the Mauritanian army. So this has been a highly controversial case. There has been lots of progress has been made in terms of immunity. So in this case, we are talking about the decision of uh, 17th of March, 2009. I was in France. Oh, he was um, in France. Uh, he has been condemned for torture. And he complained about violation of Article Number 7 regarding and saying that he could not anticipate that the Mauritanian law would not be applied and the French law would be, would be applied instead. And that the provisions of the new criminal code had been applied to him in a retroactive manner. The convention of the court is an exercise of universal jurisdiction. And this tells us or confirms uh, admirable logic. The court highlights that prohibition of culture is a mandatory norm. And it has also mentioned that although the states could claim to immunity in cases of civil acts or churches that have been conducted outside the law of the country, this does not affect 
the question of immunity of states in cases of civil action, but to the criminal accountability for the torture that has been committed. The court has stated the need to prohibit torture and to prosecute the perpetrators of these, the perpetrators. So universal jurisdiction and the convention on torture would lose their force if the only the possibility so only if the domestic legislation were to be applied. So therefore, we cannot really rule out domestic legislation in favor of universal jurisdiction to protect some people under the direct or indirect influence of the perpetrators. This would frozen the application of universal jurisdiction and would not help to achieve the, the successes uh, that have been achieved in terms of uh, torture. Former tribunal, uh, tribunal for former Yugoslavia considered that amnesty is incompatible with the duty of states to investigate these facts. This is a reason that stems from the same premise. And the court has taken into account this case because, well, the conviction is not final. It has been postponed because the events have taken place in the former Yugoslavia and are applicable or have an impact on grace measures, grace measures that were given to people, perpetrators of this crime, of these crimes. I could quote what the court says, however, the conviction is not final. To conclude, it is not easy to draw conclusions, even if they are interim conclusions. However, we can make some considerations. First of all, in view of some situations with political content. So the court hesitates between realism that has to do with real politics and the innovation that would be expected from a jurisdiction dealing with human rights. So for its benefit, we can say that the Strasbourg court has done and has been strongly criticized by some governments who that recriminate a close approach towards international jurisdiction according to protocol number 14 of the European Commission of Human Rights. Principles of subsidiarity so it, this would be a warning about the future, a future about the situation, the, the future of this situation. Well, in 1949, at the Parliament Assembly, it was said that we have to fight or stand up against the reason of the state. The, well, if we have sovereignty, we should be only sovereignty that should be respected is that the sovereignty of the moral and of morality and the sovereignty of the law. I would like to close my presentation with a quote from someone who says it is you don't really need to wait to achieve something and you don't need to achieve anything to continue with your fight, to continue persevering. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. C can you hear me? There are a few questions. Not all of them will be dealt with. But according to the questions, taking into account the reformation, uh, the reform, sorry, of universal jurisdiction and also the negative impact it has on effective uh, protection of uh, Spanish citizens. 
and they refer to current reform that has taken place uh, about universal jurisdiction, which restricts the act, the application of its uh, of the jurisdiction itself. So the question is: this kind of limitation or narrowing down could have an in, it, could it have an impact on effective protection and hence be in conflict with common law? And so be a pre-trial question to preclude enforcement. Obviously, question seems to be to be to a different topic. This European law. As you all know, yes, this, this reply is not that easy because the Strasbourg system I'm just recalling here that this uh, Strasbourg court, it's, it, it's a permanent miracle because ever since the 50s, uh, states don't know what to do. Even ourselves, we don't know what we are doing. Even the court uh, today, it, it tries uh, to go under some evolution in jurisprudence uh, and they try to decide what's, what's to be done and what's not to be done. This said, the, the is not, it's not an easy question because a friend, a, the, the, the Strasbourg Court does not have control of everything. It is about rulings that the state need to enforce. Apart from that, there are of course some problems, problems such as immunity, jurisdictional immunity for example. Because that court cannot go against that principle because it's been confirmed in January, but it is true that we've got the Supreme Court and there are some rulings there. But the court has also taken into account those decisions made in each state. So I also would like to say that the court is out there, is helping, and that way it is also lobbying on the states. I will not conceal that the, that it can be intimidatory for some states, the, or some states can be intimidatory. The UK is, is the main country which is criticizing most fiercely and has been critical to the court. And that was back in September 2001 when they were so critical. And so there is some kind of balance out there. Yes, there is a balance between those uh, states that are recognized at court and some which are exceptional. And of course, there are some exceptions to what the court is empowered to do. But about the extension of jurisdiction, for example, in Iraq, the UK has been held accountable for what's happened in Iraq, and so there is effective jurisdiction, full jurisdiction on uh, Iraq's territory. So this Strasbourg system, it is very specific, very unique, and has evolved without states knowing where they were headed or how it happened. So they were taken by surprise. Step by step, they've been surprised themselves by its evolution. And so it is necessary to try and preserve it because uh, it could also be a good way to increase jurisprudence at, at universal level as, it, as we all hope. You, you mentioned 9-11, and th there's this question asked whether the court, the 
European Court for Human Rights has had a chance in any of its rulings in, in that date or before that to define what's known as inter international terrorism, if they've had a chance. I know they've had a chance to make a statement on situations of terrorism and violation of rights in case of terrorist actions, but uh, I think it's more about the concept itself. What, what's the viewpoint, what's the, the definition from the European Tribunal for Human Rights on uh, international terrorism? Okay, national or international terrorism, there's no difference there whether it is national or, or, or international. The problem is that terrorism subjects people to serious violations of human rights, so whether it's national or international, it doesn't matter, actually. These are acts that cannot be tolerated. The jurisprudence of our court in the past has had the occasion, our court has had the occasion in the past to deal with these kind of problems, uh, of problems. Although I do not remember the number of uh, of uh, affairs, or maybe Turkey, for example, was an example, a very serious example. Those states are subject to some kind of a periodical exercise of stock taken. Obviously, there are many, many, many problems there. What are the motivations of terrorism? Well, I remember this case, Ireland, the UK, uh, back in uh, 79, when there were questions about the interrogation methodologies by the UK, because it seemed to be a cumulative uh, covering their heads, and then also when they were deprived of food and, and water. So the court in Strasbourg said, uh, we cannot justify this kind of ten, attack, of attack against dignity, personal dignity, which is so severe. So terrorists need to know that this will not be tolerated. Uh, it is also clear that after 9-11-2001, the United Kingdom has freely expelled a number of citizens of a foreign country, mainly Arab countries, who were suspected, uh, suspected of being terrorists. And that's when the Strasbourg court said, this is not possible, you cannot expel people. It doesn't matter if they are suspect of serious crimes. Because this is prohibited by Article Number Three on torture or degrading activities or abuses. So what's done by the court? Well, there is uh, they 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 fight terrorism. They they denounce terrorism, but they also need to protect human rights as well and human dignity. So we might think of terrorist attacks. Uh, in some countries, such as Spain, where we see this is part of the universal jurisdiction principle, which is universal prosecution of crimes, regardless of the of where the crimes were committed, at least so far. European Court of, Court, sorry, of Human Rights, does it take a stand on this idea of universal prosecution? Uh, the court, like as, as, as it is, it's always facing these kind of uh, situations. Ever since 2011, well, it has been over 2,500 years where we've all been, always been using the same principle. So it is just a matter of fact. Of course, there is some unbalance out there, and there is impunity, because immunity, uh, it's only for some people. So 
that makes it possible to prosecute crimes and the fact that they fight impunity so crimes are prosecuted always within legality and those are if facts or events for example this captain from the Mauritanian army well France uh, has reacted saying that this was a legal dismissal according to French law where according to their law there is an uh, uh, this has been defined, always taken into account the international law, and they could prosecute that person in France. That's what they saw. Because of acts committed in uh, another country against foreign, foreign citizens, I don't remember exactly, but uh, I think there was no connection. The same as with uh, terrorism. This is a principle that's been adopted by different legal systems in foreign countries, which is out didere, out judicare, or out punire. For example, the criminal law in Italy, that's so. And there is this universal jurisdiction that it's limited by the legislation, the national or domestic le legislation, which is important, of course. But we are talking about crimes that have been committed by citizens of its con of, of the country or of a different country. What, what's your opinion about the stand of the European Criminal Court, crimin, sorry, Court on Human Rights, and what's their opinion on Franco's crimes? Crimes committed during Franco's dictatorship. There have been several initiatives by victims who filed claims and appeals against the European Court on Human Rights for human rights they have not been admitted so far since because these were old crimes and they predate Rome's convention and the tribunal's creation, these would not be part of the competition. For what I know, victims think of it as a permanent crime since those are enforced disappearances. So the question would be, what's your opinion? And I uh, would like to know if there is an opinion from the court when it's been used for crimes committed, for example, back in uh, 1944, 1940. I remember a case in Poland where I think it went dated back to 44. Yes. My, my, my answer might be a bit more technical. The principle is the principle of uh, ratione temporis, of, of jurisdiction, that is enshrined in international law according to which we need to take into account events or crimes happened after the ratification of that convention in such state. That would be the principle. But there are a few exceptions. Well, th those exceptions are quite limited. For example, if there's a law that has been adopted after the entry into force of the convention regarding that state, and it is a review of a given number of situations, then this is a law that is claiming damage. So it is considered that since it happened after the ratification of the convention, it's reopening situations that they had already been closed according to the commission. So the first example would be that of a case where the court ruled, basically, Yanovich case against the Russian Federation on the count of a slaughter or massacre at in Katlin, which was uh, occupied Poland, where there was an execution of an official in Tailing. And the Russian people killed thousands of people. Sorry, these the, the Soviet people killed thousands of people, and they 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 
filed it against the Germans and accused the Germans, but it had been done in Tallinn. There have been some requests after that time, after in the 50s in the Russian Federation, over, a hundred, uh, over 90 investigations, but there's been no solution at all. The court, this is not the Supreme Court because we, we've got different courts, but they said this was outside their, their power, it was outside their jurisdiction because it had been way before the entry into force of the convention back in 1942-43. And then there are other cases that, that well, are different. Bronioski against Poland, for example, where we are talking about some plots that were expropriated, rail state that was expropriated and that was yielded to the uh, Russian Soviets, according to a law that was uh, voted after the entry into force of the convention. So this is a law that was considered to be permanent. Well, I guess we can tell apart these two cases. Uh, well, some have a criminal accountability that is prescribed, and um, it's uh, not the same as saying catering against humankind. But uh, that's when they are seeking reparation, and maybe it would be compared to Franco's regime. Is that considered permanent, Frank? Is it consider, if it's considered a permanent crime, would you consider it would have the power? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I can read it all, and I cannot dwell on that. There's one against Stone, Estonia. Latvia against Estonia during the military control of the Soviet Union with the German army that has aided them during an operation, a war operation, and there were those supporters. Well, the prosecution happened way after uh, these people with these supporters were killed, and then they were prosecuted. In uh, there was a, uh, the Kolonov case against the. Uh, Estonia, and the court said there was no problem regarding the legitimacy of the repair and uh, reparation and accountability rights of the victims, because it was lawful under the international criminal law. Final question, what reparation standards to victims should be taken into account as part of universal jurisdiction based on the court's case load or, or, or case law rather according to the European court so what kind of reparation standards are enforced by the ECHR special in case of universal jurisdiction uh, whenever they are referred to the court yes obviously it is all about states' accountability according to the Convention because of direct or omission acts, commission or omission acts. Naturally, we need to start by saying that if there are crimes that are serious crimes, then the Strasbourg Court demands that there is reparation in the state where they were committed. So the court has, for example, convicted a number of times these cases. For example, in Turkey, because in Turkey they had not prosecuted the perpetrators of those serious crimes, crimes where there have been abuse or abduction of people. So the court obliged uh, the effective implementation of, uh, of uh, prosecution where the crime has been um, committed. And so there is an obligation to investigate. There can also be pecuniary reparation. So if people uh, are found 
guilty, they need to be convicted, they need to have criminal accountability. Sometimes there are reparations based on moral or pecuniary prejudices, or in this case, in case of moral damage, there's also reparation. In the Strasbourg Court, we've seen also fair reparation regarding an state question. Ship, uh, Cyprus against Turkey in case of a military operation back in 74. And so there was a global agreement according to which there, there were many victims who had disappeared, had been taken away. We are talking about with uh, there, there was a reparation there that was over 19,000 million, 90 billion euros. So sometimes it is difficult to have head of the states uh, arrested because of procedural uh, uh, provisions, but I think this already been answered in his presentation when Mr. Di Salvia explained the principle of immunity and exceptions at the beginning. Thank you very much, Michelle, for your attendance and for being here with us.